Hey, you can get some cool and fun rewards for helping me help kids. Stick around after the video for more information. Well, my editing skills are crap, but can the same thing be said about Heaven Quest, A Pilgrim's Progress? Stick around and find out. Hi, I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. This is my uncut review of Heaven Quest. A Pilgrim's Progress. The synopsis on IMDb uh, for this faith-based fantasy movie is a regal man named Van Vangel is, trust on a, is excuse me, thrust on a journey against his will when he is suddenly and mysteriously arrested. Injured and lost after escaping the Dark King's men, Vangel begins to have strange dreams and visions of a mysterious woman in white calling him from the unknown territory of the North. Armed with a book called The Record of the Ancients that he receives from a wise sage named Elder, Vangel embarks on an adventure that takes him through treacherous mountain range, unending deserts, the lake of doubts, and the forest of no return. Along the way, travel companions share about a fabled good king and his son in the north, if he can make it there alive. All right. Um... Back in May, I reviewed a movie called Heaven's War. This was the first movie I'd seen that was made by Christians with an unapologetically Christian worldview driving the story and the production um, that really uh, was aiming to connect, I think, with geek audiences using lots of aesthetic trappings of fantasy, you know, swords and fantasy creatures and big magic looking things and stuff like that, you know. Um, and that was really significant. I did not like that movie at all. But I thought that it was a very significant production in terms of uh, zooming back and looking at where Christian filmmaking is right now. I think in theaters, we've seen that Christian filmmaking, um, especially that which originates from those that are already part of kind of like the Hollywood system, the Hollywood culture, is certainly improving. You know, uh, I think of the movie Luther, I think of uh, Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, um, I think of uh, The Case for Faith, or The Case for Christ, excuse me, and I think of The Shack also, with some qualifiers about, you know, some theological stuff in there. Um, and I, I see those as really significant steps forward uh, in Christian quote-unquote filmmaking. But there's this other side of Christian filmmaking that is starting from a place that is outside of the Hollywood system and uh, trying to do what they can from outside of that system to make quality movies. You know, those are the movies that like... Uh, like fireproof and those kind of like those more family type drama type things um and you know movies now like this one and so watching heaven's war and then watching heaven quest a pilgrim's progress um I i'm in a different mode uh i I'm not going to be easy on this movie. I don't feel like I was easy on Heaven's War, but I neither do I want to spend my time like bagging on it. Instead, I want to, you know, share my my thoughts about where I think it fell short and also where I think it did succeeded and then also react to this movie uh as someone who's who's just kind of on a meta level looking at Christian filmmaking, the current state of Christian filmmaking as it were. So, uh, without further ado, let's get into the story, the script, the pacing, and the tone. Uh, it's going for a serious vibe. This is based roughly on The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. That's a classic uh, Christian work. It's been around for hundreds of years. But this movie only uses the barest skeleton and a few common names now and then. Other than that, it's really taking tons of liberties, I think, in an effort to make it more interesting and edgy and... Uh, a little bit more of a story, you know, than 
Bunyan's original work was, which allegory is just like he was just unapologetically going for symbols and teaching lessons, you know. Uh, and something like this uh, is going for something that's still going to teach, that's still going to have those metaphors in there, but is going more for metaphor, heavy symbolism, than it is going for straight up in your face allegory like Bunyan's original work, you know. Um, in the intro comments to this movie, which was viewable for 48 hours, ending on October 26th, um, for as like a as like a pre-release, you know, thing for people to watch and review and you know whatever they you know just enjoy. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the, the 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 director and the producer kind of had a foreword where they shared a couple comments, and among those comments was the remark that uh, they broke every rule of of filmmaking 101. And I feel like that was said in a way of like, gosh, this movie was a struggle. We really put our all into this, and it was hard along the way because this and this and this. But um, in saying that, you know, one of the things that he said was kind of like the the rules. You know, they said we didn't have enough money, we didn't have enough time. Um, it was it didn't feel like they were apologizing for it. They were just kind of sharing their passion, you know. But one remark they made that I'm like, oh boy, well we'll see how that plays out. Was that there was no formal script for uh, the project. That's uh, you know, just the approach that they felt, you know, was wh where they were being directed by the Lord to go. And, you know, I don't know. I didn't uh, hear what he heard and sensed what he sensed. But um, I think that the result was something that did not connect with me at all. The I, I, I really, when I heard that remark, I was like, oh, well, maybe this will be kind of like just really artsy and cool in a way that I'm not expecting, you know? So I didn't, that didn't set me on a negative course in terms of how I was ready to receive this. I thought, boy, I mean, maybe this is something really going to be cool and creative in terms of how they craft the story because there's no formal script. But what I experienced was a story that um, did not function for me as a story. There are two credited uh, screenplay writers and three credited story writers, so lots of cooks in this kitchen, and um, the result was something that just does not uh, flow from one scene to the next. Even within scenes themselves, the dialogue felt like, where is this scene going? I have no idea, you know. This movie really only works for me as an allegory. Even as they were making choices, I think, to try and make it less of a, f you know, straight-up allegory, it only functions for me as an allegory. I don't feel like these characters are, you know, relatable or real or or fleshed out, really. They've got some backstory. They certainly have more backstory and more flesh on their bones than the, the, the quote-unquote characters in John Bunyan's original work, you know. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the scene, it just kind of goes from scene to scene, little episode to episode, in a almost random structure to me. There's no discernible through line for the main character's development that I could, you know, really follow. It's like, oh, I see him, like, this is his main hang-up, and, and here's how he's being developed, and here's how he's getting from A to B and C and D, and then finally E at the end, you know. Um, the dialogue often felt unnatural to me, sometimes a little stiff, and not just because it's in a fantasy setting. Uh, sometimes it felt in the same way that I would feel like um, reading, playing a JRPG that's been translated into English. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking something got lost in translation here. Now, I don't think that's what happened. I think this was probably, you know, written in English, you know, but there was kind of an awkward to us now, awkwardness to it now and then that reminded me of that kind of phenomenon as I'm watching a dubbed movie or, you know, a dubbed anime or playing a JRPG, you know, in English. Um, and as an allegory, I also had occasional questions about the underlying truth claims that were being uh, asserted, you know, and so I was like, it was it was it was not quite functioning for me as an allegory either. It's like, are you meaning to make a symbol out of this? Is that supposed to mean such and such? Because if it does, I I don't think that's necessarily biblical. I'm not sure I you know. So it didn't quite land for me either. It definitely didn't land for me as a story. And then as an allegory too, definitely had a lot of rich stuff going on. There are tons of different symbols and metaphors, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, you know. Um, but I, I also didn't know where the metaphors ended and the just plain story elements began, you know. Um, which things were intended to be symbols and which things weren't wasn't, wasn't quite clear enough for me. Uh, and that's one of the risks you take when you're trying to adapt a work like that. You know, I, uh, I, I should mention that, you know, 
I was originally creating an audio drama series based on the Pilgrim's Progress. I produced one episode of it. It's an hour long. It's called Pilgrim's Progress, Similitude of a Dream. You can download it for free over at spiritblade.com. Uh, I made the, de the decision to cancel that series, long story short, because of creative differences between myself and John Bunyan. Um, but I recognize in particular the creative challenges of trying to take a work like the Pilgrim's Progress and retain the valuable observations that Bunyan made about the Christian experience or the experience of becoming a believer from a place of, of not being a believer, you know, um, trying to adapt that rich work of his and make it something that's also a compelling story that's appealing to geeks. I mean, I think a lot of what they were going for in this movie is the same kind of thing that I was going for and that you can hear me going for in that first, uh, in that first episode. So I definitely sympathize with the creators and what their vision seemed to be for this. Uh, and I see them you know, struggling seemingly with some of the same things that I know I struggled with uh, as I was uh, working on that kind of project. Um, but anyway, let's get off of the story. That was easily the script, the story, easily the, the weakest and most, you know, disconnecting part of this experience for me. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that maybe did work a little more. And that starts with the cast and the performances. These were all unknown faces to me. The lead looks like, like he might be a brother or a cousin to Henry Cavill. I mean, he's not bulked out, but there's something about his facial features features that really reminded me of Henry Cavill. No relationship I could find. Um, he worked well for me as a performer in many scenes, but others, there were a few that felt off or overacted, and I could chalk that up possibly to directing um, what he was being told or what they were going for in the scene. He had kind of like for a while this um, companion that was traveling with him that might have influenced the acting style in the scenes that he was in. I'll get to that in a second. But it also could have been due to shooting style. You know, sometimes when they can't have a bunch of camera setups, then they can't afford to do all the close-ups that we take for granted in, you know, mainstream filmmaking. And so they have to keep the shot wide and out here, which means that the actor from a further distance is going to have to be a little bit more animated. And so maybe they kind of got into, since they were using far fewer close-ups, into a more kind of animated vibe instead of a more subtle, you know, just in the eyes kind of thing, you know, um, that, that you can allow for in other movies that have a lot more time to do all those camera setups and stuff that bring such value and allow things in the performances that wouldn't otherwise be allowed. So it could be uh, that. Um, it could be any number of things. But uh, there, there were a few scenes that... Um, I was like, this feels like you're kind of overstating it just a little bit. Like you're using your, you're moving your body just a little bit too much, just a little bit overstated, you know. And I really felt that a lot in his companion, his first companion character, who was performed in a slightly exaggerated way in his body movements and facial expressions and stuff like that, that reminded me like of a comic relief character. I was like, is he supposed to be the comic relief character? But he was rarely going for jokes. And so I wasn't sure what to make of this character. You know, he's, he's either a very, at least to, I mean, I, I don't find a lot of things funny that other people find funny, so keep that in mind. But I, I really don't think that even people that typically laugh at things that I don't laugh at would really find this, you know, would really like say, oh, that's the comic relief character, you know? Maybe they would, I don't know. But, um, but despite, you know, seemingly rarely going for jokes, he came across to me as a comic relief character in his performance, and that kind of... Uh, ungrounded the movie for me in the scenes that he was in. Uh, the main character's second companion, a character as a woman named Azera, played by an actress named Pita Sargent, also unknown to me, um, was the strongest and most consistent performer for me, bringing um, subtext and what really seemed like thoughtfulness to her role and her performance that I could really see, you know. The chief villain whose name I don't even remember, I think Apollyon um, was his name, felt really underplayed and uh, wooden to me. I would have liked a much more charismatic and interesting um, character or performer to be in that kind of role. Um, I really, you know, felt like that, that they, a, a different choice really could have been made, you know, with uh, either the casting or the directing or something, you know, with that character. And his chief henchman, um, who is kind of like this orc type character, was redubbed at least in post-production, I'm willing to bet rewritten entirely because sometimes like every they, they seem to try to avoid showing his mouth as much as possible when he was talking you know like like they'd cut quickly away they'd show his mouth just start to move and then cut away to the person who's listening to him talk you know 
or they'd have him a shot from far away, you know, so you can't really see his mouth very closely. That's when his dialogue. So I don't know what was going on there, but it seems to me there's a big disconnect from what he was, the actor was verbally doing when they were shooting and what the character was saying in the final product. Um, and it was very noticeable to me. So I'm really, really kind of odd. Um, maybe that was just part of like fighting through the mask, but I don't think so. I think his, his lip movement would have synced up more with what he, the final result was. Um, yeah. If all he was doing was fighting through the mask anyway. Okay. Stunts and visuals. Now this, I think at least visuals, maybe not stunts visuals is probably the strongest part of this movie for me. The visual effects are less ambitious and less frequent than say like heaven's war or the mythica series, but they're about the same quality in terms of the visual effects, and there were some really nice, um, like, uh, I want to say, like, uh, atmosphere shots or, like, a st uh, establishing shots, you know, where you, that would look like a helicopter. I mean, everyone saw there'd be, like, a shot that was like a helicopter shot looking thing, and I'm betting they did it with a drone, you know, and that's the cool thing about technology advancing is, like, now, if you want some of those cool, quote-unquote, helicopter shots, you don't need the helicopter all you need is a drone you can get for a hundred bucks, stick a camera on it, and you can really do some amazing things if you've got someone who really knows how to control it, you know. So um, there was lots of cheap green screen, but also some, uh, you know, n nice sets as well, and, and city shots and other elements and other kind of like uh, st still shots of, of things that I think were probably CG fabricated, but still looked uh, uh, nice. It was It was a bit inconsistent, but again, you know, if you're uh, comparing this to a, a series like the Mythica series, which is a, you know, it's not a Christian series. It's, it's made, I think, specifically for geeks, people who like the D&D &D flavor of fantasy that, like, most fantasy movies won't quite commit to. You know, that look of magic and that look of monsters and that look of the world and stuff. They just full go on into that and really scratch that nerd itch really, really well. Um, but the sacrifice, I think, for going for that kind of aesthetic so hard is you're maybe not able to attract the same amount of finances, the same kind of talent, and, you know, those kinds of things. And so, you know, there's a trade-off, I guess is what I'm getting at with the Mythica series and with something, a project like this, where it's scratching a particular itch that is not being scratched elsewhere, but that means that you're going to have to put up with some other things, and in this case, you know, the budgetary issues with the visual effects is one. But um, the costumes, I really want to say, all looked pretty solid to me there was one woman who i was like that looks like a community theater costume that's uh that looks noticeably of lower quality than the others but really i i thought the, the rest was good the makeup and stuff you know and putting smudges on people making them look dirty and like they've been out in nature and stuff you know i felt like they were doing you know good work um at the very least you know kind of like a, a like a tv budget type you know quality you know so i i really my hat goes off to them definitely for the for the costuming and the makeup for the most for the most part i think in a daytime shot with the orc. Uh, it looks a little rubbery, but anyway. Um, let's see. Combat sequences, which sometimes felt put in just to try and appeal to people who would want them, you know? Lacked any real complexity. Uh, choreography was minimal. Camera cuts and other tricks were used to kind of cover shortcomings and try to fancy things up with slow motion or, you know, whatever. Uh, but it still felt like an element that needed more. I do appreciate that there were some spurts now and then where they would use some clever editing to do some cool, trippy, symbolic types of things or, like, show that someone's having a vision that they don't understand or whatever, you know. So uh, every once in a while they would do some cool editing stuff that I think really contributed to the, uh, the visual quality of the film as a whole. So I, I think that visually that was probably the strongest part of the movie for me. Now, as far as, like, uh, themes, is there any themes that might trigger some worthwhile thought um, or conversation about moral, philosophical, or spiritual issues? Well, you know, you might think, well, sure there are, you know? And yes, there are uh, metaphors here about coming to faith from a starting point of feeling burdened and oppressed. There are metaphors for forgiveness, for newness in Christ, and living in the purpose of God's kingdom right now. There are metaphors of self-deception and life's distractions from what's important. You know, a lot of Bunyan's metaphors did get carried over. A ton weren't, you know, they didn't have time to do, you know, all of them, but uh, a, a good chunk of them, you know, were carried over. And you can catch most of these, I think, if you're looking for them. But uh, they are faint enough and vague enough that I would have prefer preferred a movie with fewer of them that brought those, those fewer out more fully or more richly in some way. And I think that's likely 
likely a problem that's inherent to trying to adapt this classic work, you know, from a bold-faced allegory to something that's more just heavily symbolic. All right, so wrapping up here, I have no idea what your taste in movies are, but if I were a time traveler, I'd go back in time and say, Peter, skip, skip this one, you know, you... You aren't personally pulled to Christian fiction unless it can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe in quality with the mainstream alternatives, you know? So this isn't, you're not the audience for this. Uh, this, this experience is going to ask you to forgive way too much in order to have a Christian-based fantasy movie with some legit geek appeal, and you're just not that hungry for a Christian-based fantasy movie with some, you know, legit geek appeal. Um, so that's about all I have to say about that. I'm, I share my expanded thoughts and also some spoilery thoughts in my uh, spoiler car video series, and you can get my spoiler-filled reactions to Heaven Quest uh, Pilgrim's Progress in that series. It's just one of many perks available for your support over at patreon.com slash spiritblade productions. That's going to be going up as my spoiler car videos always do for uh, patrons um, uh, the same day, the same day as my review. Um, let's see here. The There's no MPAA rating for this one, but I would describe it as PG-13-ish for violence. All right, those are my thoughts. I'd love to get yours in the comments below. Please like, share, subscribe, uh, click that bell, anything you want to do to share this content and uh, stay connected to it, I would be grateful for. Uh, I want to thank the Spirit Blade Insiders for making this review possible. Uh, again, more information at patreon.com slash spiritbladeproductions. And then I hope you'll join us soon over at christiangeekcentral.com as we continue to geek out and seek the truth. Hey, Peter Franson here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. For my sixth consecutive year, I'm participating in Extra Life, a charity event that raises funds to provide medical care for children in urgent need. I'm also leading the Christian Geek Central Extra Life team, which you're still welcome to join by following the link in the description below. Once again this year, I'm drawing attention to our team's fundraising by performing a 24-hour marathon of video gaming that I will stream live on YouTube.com slash ChristianGeekCentral and ChristianGeekCentral.com beginning 6 a.m. Pacific Time on Saturday, November 2nd. You can donate on my page or on any team member's page by following the links below where you will also find incentives and rewards for doing so. For example, on my page, for $5 or more, you can choose a topic to add to my plus three page of many topics that I'll be blabbing my opinions on during the live stream. For $10 or more, you get the previous reward and a download code for a free copy of the Spirit Blade Special Special Edition Audio Drama. For $20 or more, you get the previous rewards and you can choose a game for me to play during my November 2nd live stream. Pick a favorite or torture me with something terrible or rage-inducingly difficult. For $30 or more, you get the previous rewards and you can choose a song for me to sing during my November 2nd live stream. Pick an old favorite of yours or just make me humiliate and torture myself with something no one wants to hear. And for $50 or more, you get all the previous rewards and a download code for every MP3 product at spiritblade.com. That's an $80 value. On top of that, I've set fundraising milestones that will unlock strange and unusual happenings as I reach them. At $200, I'll have a free download day for everyone who visits spiritblade.com on November 6th. And as my total goes beyond $200, I'll unlock increasingly more content for that free download day. I will also let my boys tickle me for one minute straight during my November 2nd live stream. And depending on how far beyond $200 my fundraising goes, I will cover my face in peanut butter and jelly while talking about horror movies, put on a frozen solid t-shirt the morning of my live stream while playing video of me singing soothing classical music at my senior recital in college, shoot water up my nose with a turkey baster, get my wife Holly to play a game with me for 30 minutes of the live stream, or the grand daddy of all milestones, squirm intensely, mortified while showing an embarrassing video clip from the original stage version of Spirit Blade. Now there are some stipulations and time limits on those rewards and milestones, so quickly follow the link below to my fundraising page for all the details. I hope you'll be a part of helping me and the Christian Geek Central team do some good for some kids uh, who really need it. And then, please join me at uh, youtube.com slash christiangeekcentral for my 24-hour marathon starting at 6 a.m. Pacific on Saturday, November 2nd. Hope to see you there.